Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Salam TV's virtual winter spiritual retreat program 2020. Salam TV Muslim Network is a YouTube channel that will bring with it a range of spiritual, educational, entertaining content for all Muslims in North America and around the world. Today, we have a very distinguished speaker, Sheikh Abdul Wahab Salim, today with us. He's a Canadian Islamic scholar, speaker, and author. He has studied with, engaged, and exchanged thoughts with hundreds of Islamic scholars from around the globe. These rich experiences have led him to respect and celebrate the diversity of perspectives within Muslims. He holds a diploma in Arabic and Islamic culture and a Bachelor of Education in Fiqh and Usul al-Fiqh from the renowned King Saud University, Riyadh. He also has a postgraduate diploma in Islamic banking and insurance from the United Kingdom and a Master of Arts in Tafsir and Ulum al-Quran from Malaysia. Additionally, he has licenses, ijazah, to teach all Islamic sciences from many leading scholars of our time. He also received an ijazah in recitation of Imam Asim, Hafs, and Shuba. Abdul Wahab Salim is the founder of Salik Academy. He has taught and lectured at venues in several countries around the world, just as made appearances and presented complete seasons on various TV stations and YouTube channels, including Al Hijra TV, Huda TV, Ramadan TV. Sharjah TV, Daily Reminder, and more. Welcome, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Habsalim. Uh, and today our topic is Five Pillars, A Fresh Quranic Look by uh, Sheikh Abdullah Habsalim. Please, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm happy to be with all of you for this uh, beautiful retreat. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the tawfiq to practice, to convey, and to benefit from uh, this retreat and all the beautiful speeches that uh, will be given within it. And my topic today is a fresh Quranic look at the five pillars of Islam. I know that every single one of us, we know about the five pillars of Islam. We know about the uh, these pillars since we were children. We learned about them as we were taught, perhaps even as we were toddlers. We learned about Salah. We learned about Siyam. We learned about Zakat. We learned about Hajj. We learned about, before all of that, the testimony of faith. And we know that the Quran is filled with guidelines on this. And uh, the Quran has so much uh, details on the on these particular subjects because essentially these are considered some of the cornerstones of, of our faith. Um, what I want to do today is, though, I don't want to talk about the basic uh, details about the five pillars of faith. I think that all of us uh, pretty much know that. I want to talk about uh, some subtleties that the Quran has related to these particular pillars. Now, as a uh, precursor to that, let's just do a basic outline of these pillars of uh, faith. We know that first and foremost, in order for us to be considered Muslims and in order for us, our deeds to be considered acceptable, we have to bear the testimony of faith. And that testimony of faith consists of two things. It consists of the fact that you bear witness that there is no God worthy of your worship and devotion except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that uh, simultaneously, you also bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the messenger of Allah. Now, there is there are two very important things over here. Number one, that Allah subhanahu wa taala is the God that we worship, and that uh, two, we obey the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we accept him as a messenger. In our times, we have two fitness, two trials, and two tribulations that we're faced with, and that is that there are a group of people out there who. Uh, want to deny the existence of a God uh, as a whole. And then they want to say that all of the things in this world that we see today, every single thing, it just came out of nothing. And we know that the, this is naturally, we know that this is an impossibility because of many different reasons. One of those reasons, and the most obvious of those reasons is that by our you know, trial and testing, you know, our approach of trying and testing the empirical approach, we know that there is nothing in this world that comes out of nothing. We have to have something in order for that uh, other thing to come about. So if you will not have a chair, except that there happens to be someone who made that chair naturally, you will not have this world, except that there is someone who made that world as well. And we also know that all of these causes, one thing causing another, another thing causing a third, another thing causing a fourth, these causes have to come to an end. 
meaning there has to be an uncaused causer, meaning there has to be someone to whom all of these causes finish, because if we don't have an uncaused causer, then there will be an eternal regression of causes, and that is an impossibility because today wouldn't exist except if we had an uncaused causer who caused the trickling effect of the dominoes to take place in order for us to have today, okay? So that is the first thing. The second factor and the second point is that uh, there are a group of people today who do believe in God, and perhaps they even believe that the right faith and the right religion happens to be Islam, but they don't believe, practically speaking, in the second testimony of faith, and that is that they do not accept the guidance of the Messenger وسلم, to be a guidance that is worthy of following. The first group, we know them as atheists who disbelieve in God, and the second group, we know them as those who have accepted Islam, accepted God as well, but they are Quranist, meaning they say, we only accept what the Quran has to say, but we don't accept what the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, has to say. And we say, in order for you to be a true Muslim, you need to believe in God. You need to accept the fact that there is a God. You need to accept the fact that he sent down messengers. You need to accept the fact that these messengers had been given guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the finality of them is the Prophet Muhammad. And in addition to that, you have to also accept the second testimony of faith. And that is that the Prophet Muhammad is the finality of the messenger and we need to obey what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent with as well. Now, what about the second testimony? Uh, what about the second pillar of faith? And this is where I really want to start the crux of my talk today, inshallah ta'ala. I personally believe that in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind us that the legislations that he's giving us, they are worthy of following, along with each verse that he sends down, around it, somewhere on that page, perhaps in the very verse, perhaps in the verse before it, perhaps in the verse after it, perhaps in the compilation of three or four verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us some sort of a miracle or he gives us some sort of uh, a pointer that's going to remind us of the beauty of the Quran which will allow us to submit ourselves to accepting this pillar and then in turn of course following and obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that regard as well. And I'll start at prayer because that's the first of the pillars after the testimony. And we know that a precursor to prayer happens to be tahara, right? If you open up any uh, book of fiqh, you'll notice that the, the fuqaha, they always start off with tahara, then they go to salah, zakat, siyam, and hajj, and so forth, right? So a precursor to prayer is a tahara. Without tahara, you are unable to pray because you need to be purified in order for you to be able to pray, right? That's a definite. So considering that, my dear brother, my dear sister, let's look at the word of tahara in the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he, uh, in, in the Arabic language, even before that, in the Arabic language, there's two ways for us to refer to tahara. And remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never chooses one word over another, except that he has a reason to do so. He's not going to choose a word without any, uh, any reason. Uh, actually, uh, you know, I've done a lot of research on this particular topic, and that is the word choices within the Quran. And I noticed through that research and through the time that I spent with these uh, words, I noticed that uh, Allah ne never chooses a word and then leaves out and off another word, except that there's a reason why he does that. And literally, the Arabic language, without exaggeration, and this is something that you can search up even on Google if you want, literally it has hundreds of thousands, if not over a million words, meaning there are a lot of words to get around. But Allah has chosen a selection of words, and he doesn't uh, use... Uh, all the words within the Arabic language. There's a lot to go around, but he will pick one and perhaps the one that is the, that is the best. Now, we know that that in Arabic, in order for to refer to purification or to refer to cleansiness, throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not use the alternative, and that is nadafa, even though the Prophet used that word. But he uses a tahara throughout. And there is a reason for that, because the word tahara, it has two components to it. And many times when Allah uses the word tahara in the Quran, both of those two components are there. The first component is that it is the physical purification. Okay, So when you physically purify, that is within the Arabic language tahara, that is a form of tahara. 
to physically purify. You have some filth on your hand, you go and wash it off. That is called tahara. Similarly, there is another meaning to the word tahara, and that is that is a metaphorical uh, purification as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to remind us through this usage of this word within the Quran and the consistency of it and the neglect of the other word, an nidhafa. He wants to remind us that he wants you to be physically purified, O Muslim, and he also wants you to be spiritually purified and, and metaphorically purified as well. Meaning he wants you to have a spiritual development and purification and simultaneously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to also be purified physically speaking as well. And there are actually places in the Quran where he uh, he brings both meanings in one, one place. So for instance, when Allah is talking about the people who purify themselves, and he's, he's referring specifically to the, the people of the Quba in some of the narrations, he says, Therein are people, they wish to purify themselves. And he uses the word, Tahara again. And the scholars of Tafsir, they said that over here, Allah is trying to say that they love to purify themselves physically because what they used to do was they would do istinja and, and istinja is physical purification. After you answer the call of nature, you wash yourself, that's called istinja. So that is physical purification. So they would physically purify themselves. And in addition to their physical purification, they would also purify themselves and rectify themselves from sin. And they would purify themselves when it comes to their hearts as well. So this is a physical purification and a spiritual pur purification taking place uh, together. Now, the point here is that by using this word and preferring it over, for example, right? by using the word Allah is able to pack more meaning into the, the verse, right? And that, that shows the, the rhetorical superiority of, of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Because the claim that the Quran makes is that the Quran is considered the, the, the best literary work in, in the world, meaning that the, there is no human being who can bring something in its literary capacity and in terms of the word choice, sentence structure, in terms of the even the... the the sound and the tone of the word selected as well. It, it, there is no other book that can that can be comparable comparable to the to the Quran in this way. So that means that every time there's a word, we should look deeper and say, "Hey, why don't I take this word and switch it up with another one in the language? Is it going to render all the same meanings that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is trying to say?" Well, we'll say that no. And I've personally, as I said, spent hundreds of hours researching the word selection of the Quran, and I can say with great confidence, inshallah ta'ala, that I've never seen a single word in the Quran that's been selected by Allah in one place, and then I try to replace it with another, and I find all the same type of uh, meanings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had meant. De definitely that's not the case. So over here, uh, this is another one of those examples that, and by the way, this is even more unique than maybe much of what I'll say today. Why? Because in this case, this is consistent throughout the Quran in the same way, meaning, Allah did not choose the word nadafa, for instance, in the Quran at all. And this is what we call, this is what we call uh, kalima Qur'aniya, a word which is a Quranic word, meaning Allah selected one and, and left off another. So tahara is the Quranic term. Nadafa is an Arabic term which we can use, but it's not necessarily mentioned in, in the Quran. And I'll give you another example. So for, exa for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also related to Tahara, He says, وَيُنَزِّلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا أَنْ لِيُطَهِرَكُمْ بِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals upon you from the heavens water so that He may purify you with this water. Now, we know that the water, water has the utility to purify physically, and it also has the utility to have metaphorical purification as well. How does that work? Okay, well, you see, when we talk about purification in the uh, in in Islam, we have two different types of purification, right? Rituals. That is, you can uh, you can either just wash yourself from some filth that happens to be on you. That is like istinja, for instance, or if you're uh, if some filth end up coming, you know, getting stuck to your hand, then you just wash it off. That filth is gone. That is one form of purification. 
But then there is another type of purification as well, and that is that you wash yourself in order for you to raise the ritual impurity from you. And when you're ritually impure, meaning you have hadath, meaning let's say you've broken your wudu or you have to make a ghusl, there's nothing physically impure about you. There is no physical impurity for a person who has broken their wudu. When they go and make wudu, they might be as clean as anything, right? But there's a ritual uh, impurity that is being raised, right? That's what they call hadith. Now, again, if we were to use the word navafa, which is the equivalent to tahara, which is the quote-unquote synonym of, of tahara, right? We wouldn't get that meaning because navafa is specific to only physical impurities. It cannot be used for something that is a metaphorical impurity. Okay, so that's another reason why a tahara is a better word to use by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just like that, by the way, there's around 15 different usages of the word tahara, and I look through all of them in the Quran to see if in any place, in any of the 15 different usages, right, in any of those, is it possible for us to switch it with another word? And, and I realized that in all of them, without exception, uh, you can't replace the word tahara with the word nafafa. And that's again showing the superiority of the selection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to uh, words, word choice, okay? And I'll give you another example, okay? Another example. Well, there's actually so many examples. Maybe what I'll do is I'll move on to another another topic perhaps even because the examples, if we just keep on uh, going, even with Tahara, as I said, I've looked through all 15 occurrences and I noticed that in every single place, it is uh, more superior to use the word tahara and less so when it comes to the word nadafa. Okay. So another another topic or another example would be the word tayammum. Okay. Now I'm going to let you in on something that is perhaps new to you when it comes to the word tayammum. Firstly, we know that that uh, everyone when we hear the word tayammum immediately, what do you think of? You think of Doing tayammum. Hey, brother, maybe I'll ask you, what do you think of tayammum when you, when you hear about tayammum? Well, I, what I think is uh, with the tayammum, like doing the, if you can't find water, then you go yes. to, the, to the soil. Of course, of course. That's exactly what, what tayammum means. Now, that's pretty much what the word tayammum became known to mean after Islam came about. Okay. But essentially, if we look at the origin of the word tayammum, it, it doesn't actually mean uh, a dry ablution, as we as we call it now. Okay, in every book of fiqh, when you think of tayammum, immediately you think of dry ablution. Okay, that is a technical meaning that has been codified by Muslims. Uh, and uh, but when Allah is addressing people in the Quran, He addresses them not with the meaning that was later codified okay not with the meaning that was later codified rather he's addressing them with the meaning that the arabs knew so in the quranic language the word tayammum it doesn't actually mean the dry ablution as we know it which is if you don't have water okay you go and make quote unquote a concept called tayammum so as of yet the, the concept of, of, of tayammum, yes, it is found in the hadith, the Prophet said it's tayammum mudarbatan. But what I'm saying is in the Quranic language, Allah is not yet codifying it into, um, into uh, a concept called tayammum. Rather, he's using the term as the Arabs know to use it, which is, which is to, uh, which is to al-qast, okay? Which is to direct yourself towards something. So that's what the word tayammum essentially means. It's, it means to direct yourself towards something uh, and, and to seek it out very, very rigorously. To seek something out very rigorously, that is what the word tayammum means, i.e. tawakhi. And that's what uh, the famous uh, linguist by the name of Al-Khalil ibn Ahmad al-Farahidi, he uh, explained the word tayammum in, in the ayah itself with, with this understanding as well. And he said that the, the idea that people took the word tayammum and they made it into a a concept, this wasn't necessarily there in the origin of the language, and that wasn't the usage that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought in the Quran as well. Now I'll explain why I'm saying all of this, right? Because 
we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran when he says that um, فَتَيَمَّمُ صَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا then, then go and look for uh, dirt which happens to be pure so you may use it to wipe your face and wipe your hands if, if there is no water and if you're unable to make uh, wudu or husn. Now, he is not saying go and make tayammum, even if I might have translated that because I'm so used to it. He's saying go and direct yourself towards, towards dirt which is pure. That's what Allah is saying. Go and direct yourself and seek out rigorously so dirt which happens to be pure so that you may be able to do what is later going to be called tayammum. Okay? So there's a difference now between that and between, between what we know to be demo, a little bit of a difference. And let, let me explain it. It's a little bit confusing, but inshallah, I'll try to break it down in a way. And I won't move on until it's understood, inshallah. Okay. So what Allah is saying is that if you don't have water, then go and work hard for you to seek out dirt, which is pure, so that you may be able to tap your hands on it, wipe your face with it, and tap your hands and wipe your hands with it as well. Okay? That is a tayammu. As the Prophet said, tayammum darbatan, darbatun ilwaji, darbatun That tayammum is done in this way that you uh, uh, smack your hands on the ground or you tap your hands on the ground and, and you wipe your face with it and then you uh, tap your hands on the ground again and you uh, wipe your uh, hands with it. Okay? So that's how the Prophet explained it. Allah is saying, search out, seek out. Now, the thing is that many times Muslims, they, when they're making tayammum, they forget the, the, the most important part of tayammum, which is what's codified or in the word, and that is to seek out the dirt. Okay? It's not that you just go and smack your hands on anything you see or tap your hands on anything you see or go to the wall and just rub your hands on there and then go ahead and make the imam. Allah is telling you that you have to seek out that dirt. You have to search for the, the, the just as you go and search for water, you don't just take Pepsi and pour it on your hands and say, Khalas, I've made wudu, right? Or, or your face and, and so forth. You go and seek out the water if you don't have it. Similarly, if you don't have the dirt, you're going to have to go search it out. That's what tayammum means, okay? And, and, and tayammum also has the concept of amam within it, like facing it. So go and seek it and face it. It's before you. Famsahu. Now you wipe. Okay? Now you start to, to wipe. Now, now that we understand that the word, what the word tayammum actually means, there's actually another place in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also uses the word tayammum with this linguistic meaning, not with the technical meaning that became so famous among Muslims that they forgot the original linguistic meaning, which is to face, direct, and uh, seek out rigorously. Okay? So, Allah uses the word tayammum in the in the verse related to spending in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? How so? But with this linguistic meaning that I've explained. He says, in Surah Al-Baqarah, he says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, أَنْفِقُوا مِنْ طَيِّبَاتِ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ وَمِمَّا أَخْرَجْنَا لَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا تَيَمَّمُوا الْخَبِيثَ مِنْهُ تُنْفِقُونَ وَلَسْتُمْ بِآخِذِهِ إِلَّا أَنْ تُغْمِضُوا فِيهِ وَأَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, who you believe, spend from the most purest of wealth that you've earned and also spend from everything that we allow the earth to give up to you as well, meaning all the crops that you get. وَلَا تَيَمَّمُوا الْخَبِيثَ مِنْهُ تُنْفِقُونَ And don't, don't what? Don't do tayammum to the filthy wealth of yours. Meaning don't face yourself to the filthy wealth of yours. Don't turn your, your intentions of donating for the sake of Allah to specifically the stuff that you don't necessarily want. And it's the... It's all the junk that you're going to be throwing out anyways or garage sailing it or checking it out, right? Don't turn your, your faces to that when you're trying to spend in the path of Allah. And he, then he says, Things that you yourself would never take unless someone makes you close your, close your eyes 
and then accept it. So give to people what you're going to be willing to accept yourself and don't turn your faces towards the wealth that you would never want to accept yourself. Okay? What does this mean? This means that Allah wants to, you to imagine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to imagine your wealth in two categories. Okay? He wants you to imagine wealth which is absolutely pure wealth. So what you've done is you've taken your wealth and divided it. You have $100,000 and out of that $100,000, $90,000 inshallah is absolutely pure. Another 10000 is not so pure. So he's saying don't go towards that 10 which is, which is impure and take it and spend it in the way of Allah. Okay? But there's another thing over here as well. By telling you that go and spend only from the pure and don't spend from the impure is also telling you that don't spend from the third category, which is a mixture of the pure and the impure. Okay? And all of this will not be understood unless the word tayammum is used. And why is that? Let me explain. Tayammum, it means to face something with your face. To stand in front of it. If Allah says, do not face your face towards the impure and spend from the pure, he's basically telling you, divide your wealth into two categories, the pure, the impure, and the pure. Don't face the impure, but face the pure, meaning don't have a third category, which is the mixture of the pure and the impure. Okay? So all of that is happening where? It's happening in the word thing. If any other word is brought, then that idea of dividing into two categories, facing one and not facing the other, that, that's, that entire uh, imagery that Allah is trying to make is lost, right? So, وَلَا تَيَمَّمُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنْهُ تُنْفِقُونَ وَلَسْتُمْ بِآخِذِهِ إِلَّا أَنْ تُغْنِضُوا فِيهِ And don't give your wealth from the filthy wealth uh, that you yourself wouldn't be willing to accept if, unless someone makes you close your eyes uh, and then and, and take it in that way. Okay, so this is... Just two examples of, of words uh, related to prayer, because by tayammum and tahara, they're both related to prayer, right? Okay, they're related to prayer in the Quran, and there's others as well. And I'll go now to another concept, okay? I'll go now to the second pillar of, of Islam. Uh, sorry, the third pillar of Islam, and that is the zakat. And, and same thing, even with the zakat, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word choices, they... They're very uh, unique, okay? And um, even within giving, the word choices are very unique. And the word that I want to talk to you about uh, when it comes to zakat is the word poor, okay? And destitute. Poor and destitute. You'll always, always hear these words whenever we're talking about zakat, which is giving for uh, obligatory charity for the sake of Allah. Now, Allah has eight categories of recipients for zakat in the Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah At-Tawbah, verse number 60, He says, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَةِ That charity, i.e. obligatory charity, is going to be for people who are destitute and also for the masakin, for those people who happen to be miskin as well, which means the poor. Now, what's the difference between a faqir and a miskin? They're both kind of poor, but there's a difference between those two. Of course, the scholars, when it comes to the fuqaha, they, they disagreed, but I'll give you what I believe to be the right opinion, and that is that um, the fuqara are, are people who are unable to um, afford, um, they're not even able to afford 50% of their needs. Okay, whereas the masakin, they're able to uh, afford more than 50%, but they can't get to the 100%. Okay, so that's the difference. So a miskin is poor, and also a faqid is poor. A faqid is very poor, is destitute, whereas a miskin is uh, poor, but he's not as poor as a faqid. He's above 50%, okay? So that's the difference. Now, in the Quran, the word faqid is very rarely mentioned, okay? In the Quran, the word faqid, which is very poor, it's very rarely mentioned, okay? And even that, actually, to be honest, it's only mentioned three times in the Quran in reference to charity. And we know that Quran is always telling us to be charitable, right? But to think about that for a second. 
it's only mentioned three times in the Quran in reference to charity. And miskin, which is less poor, okay, who is less poor, miskin is mentioned around 20 plus times in reference to charity. I want you to kind of completely understand this before I move to the next point because I'll be building on it. Faqir is more poor, but it's only, there's only three occurrences of the word faqir in the Quran in reference to char being charitable. Miskin is less poor, but there's around 20 plus references in the Quran to being charitable to a miskin. Why? How? Okay. Well, I mean, it would only, it would make sense if you were to think with our human minds that, hey, uh, if someone is more poor, I've got to be concerned even more about him. And that's why it's more necessary for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind us of giving charity to the more poor. Okay. So there's a number of reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this. And I look through again every occurrences. Uh, every occurrence of both words in the Quran to kind of see what's happening, why Allah is choosing this over here and that over there. Okay, so let's start with the the word uh, faqir. So the word faqir is mentioned, as I said, three times. One of those times is then uh, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa in lakum." If you take your sadaqa, hide it, and give it to the people who are destitute, that is better for you. And the second occurrence is in the verse, the only verse in the Quran where. Uh, both faqir and, and miskin are mentioned in the same place, and that is Surah at tawbah number 60. Lil fuqara. The sadaqat happen to be for fuqara specifically. And the third occurrence is uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about giving to a per feeding people, uh, someone who's very destitute and in a very traumatic situation. He says, al faqir, and give to a person who's uh, going through severe difficulty and is destitute as well. It, feed him, Allah says. Okay. Now, when it comes to miskin, again, twenty odd occurrences. Now, if you just remember the yatama and masakin, you will immediately know that again and again, Allah says the yatama and the masakin, the orphans and the masakin, the, the poor people. And He also says, for example, those people who are unable to fast, that they should give fidya as food for them, miskin, for the person who is poor and not destitute. Okay. And He also speaks in reference to kafara as well when He says, uh, food of 10 miskins. So, why miskin more often than? Then, faqir. I think, wallahu alam, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, using the social intelligence and language. Okay? We know that the word faqir is e very, very poor. But it's socially relevant that people use the word miskin. Okay? People use the word miskin to refer to anything that, ha that, that deserves pity. Okay? And this is something that even Abu Hidar al-Askari, uh, who died in the year um, 406, uh, Hijrah, he, he pointed this out also in his book Al-Furuq, where he said that, that the, one of the differences between uh, faqir and miskin is that the, word, that the faqir is a, is a person who is destitute, sure, but miskin, like people, they, whenever they feel pity for something, they use the word miskin, okay? So sometimes, like, uh, if someone, you know, uh, is uh, doesn't have a spouse, so someone will say, what a miskin, he doesn't have a spouse, okay? Or she doesn't have a spouse. So that, that there's this sense of pity within the word miskin. That's not there within the word faqir. And this is not something that is a new phenomenon. This is not uh, a phenomenon within our social culture today. This is for hundreds of years. As I said, in the... Year 406, Abu Hilal al-Askari is mentioning this. So this is something within the language and within the culture of the Arabs. And then it obviously became a Muslim culture as well, where we use the word miskin to refer to something that deserves pity. So Allah is capitalizing on that sense of pity that people have for a miskin by mentioning miskin again and again and again throughout the Quran. So that it will draw some pity within them and then they will be more willing to give for the sake of Allah. Rabbul okay, so that's uh, one of the, the, the points here.
And another point is that Allah uh, wanted to make the word faqir more particular to him, meaning uh, when it comes to your faqir to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why in three places in the Quran, the word faqir, which is being destitute and that severe need, that severe need is connected to Allah. So that you're, you're reminded that your severe need should always be for Allah and it shouldn't be to the people. Okay? You can have some need to the people, sure, but that severe need, maintain that for Allah because He's the one who is uh, severely capable. And uh, that's why when Allah says in the Quran, He says, Wallahu al ghaniyu wa antum al fuqara. Allah is the ever rich and you are the fuqara. You are the people who are, uh, who are fuqara, destitute, in need. In need of who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He also says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, antum al fuqara u Allah. You are the ones who are ever needy to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu huwa al-ghaniyul hamid. So over there, the need that he, uh, the word that he uses to describe the need is al-fuqara. And similarly, in, in the third place, Allah says that in yakunu fuqara. Now he's talking about singles that are ready to get married and, and they're in severe need. So he says, if they happen to be fuqara, if they happen to be destitute, severely needy, don't worry. Allah will come in and Allah will enrich them. Okay? So in the Quran, often the word faqr comes connected with Allah, so you realize that severe need should always be for Allah. And, and often when giving comes with miskeen, so that people's emotions are capitalized on and people feel pity for the needy and they give to the people. Okay? So this is how Allah uses these words, and, and, and this is truly uh, you know, they're phenomenal because there's social intelligence in the way Allah is using using the word as well. Okay, and the last thing, and this is very important, and that is because the word faqr, okay, the word faqr is, is specific to need, okay? Whereas the word miskin is not always specific to need. So when the word faqr was almost, not almost, when the word faqr is always related to need, then Allah says that that word that's always related to need is more befitting of me because I'm the one who always fulfills needs. Whereas the word miskin is not always related to need. Sometimes it's just related to, as I said, pity that people have for others, even if that person is not needy. I'll give you an example. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes uh, the Banu Israel. He says, Allah has struck upon them Humility and maskana as well. Now, there are a lot of rich people that were there within Banu Israel, but they still were described as maskana. Because people can still feel, feel pity for someone who has money. Okay? So that, that's, that's the, the idea there. So, uh, whereas the word faqr doesn't have that possibility where a person uh, is faqir and yet still very wealthy at the same time. Okay? And uh, and, and I'll just mention one last point here. And that is that um, there is, and this is kind of unrelated yet related at the same time, there is one more usage of the word miskin, and that is in the hadith of the Prophet, in the dua of the Prophet, where he said, Allahumma ahyini miskinan wa amitni miskinan wa hsirni fi zumratil masakin. Oh Allah, make me live as a miskin, make me die as a miskin, and raise me up also within the within the ranks of the masakin okay so what does that mean is he trying to say poverty no that's not what allah's prophet sallallahu is trying to say some people they falsely understood the word miskin over here to mean poverty notice just the last point i pointed out the word miskin is not always related to poverty sometimes it's just related to uh, uh, pity and sometimes it's related to something else so over here what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is trying to say here is that oh allah uh, raise me as a person who's got humility because uh, because the poverty sometimes makes a pump person humble so there's a connection between that he's saying make me a person who's humble raise me between between the ranks of the humble ones and and, and raise me up on the day of judgment among the masakin i.e. the ones who have been humbled as well the reason why we know this is because the prophet didn't die poor okay if the Prophet had, uh, had made this dua and intended by that poverty, then, then he would have died poor. We know that there's 
uh, enough evidence that the Prophet ﷺ had not died uh, a poor man. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ had uh, the gardens that were in Medina alter his name through the fight. And the Prophet ﷺ had the gardens also of Fadak as well to his name. Uh, a person who has that much real estate to his name is not called poor. So the Prophet didn't die poor, but he still said, Oh Allah, make me live a miskin, die a miskin, and yet uh, raise me up on the day of judgment among the group of the miskin. So he didn't die poor, and that again goes back to the fact that the faqr, the word faqr, is very particular to need, whereas the word miskin is not. And that's why Allah chooses the word faqr always or, or often. Uh, with his own self, meaning he wants to tell you your fakr, oh slave of mine, should always be for me and not for anybody else. Okay, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us, uh, uh, you know, guidance, taqwa, afaf, and ghina, as the Prophet used to say, Allahumma inni as'aluk al huda wa tuqa wa afafa wa ghina. Oh Allah, I ask you for guidance, I ask you for piety, I ask you for chastity and also I ask you for, for wealth as well and uh, that leads me to another pillar and that would be the, the fourth pillar okay uh, brother if you want to jump in anytime you're always welcome inshallah um, well mashallah it's going very good very smooth please uh, please continue okay inshallah. Allah. Allah okay so uh, the fourth pillar uh, of course is the, the pillar of, of fasting okay now there's a rule that is in the Arabic language, which I need to explain before I move on to talking about this. The rule is as such that ziyadatul mabna tadullu ala ziyadatul ma'na. That whenever there's more letters in a word, that more letters usually should give more meaning as well. Okay. So when a word has more letters within the Arabic language, I know in other languages this may not be the case, but uh, within the Arabic language, and also for the most part, when there are more letters, then that would render more meaning. This is not a rule that's hard and fast, occurs every single time, but it is one of those rules that happens most of the times within the language. So the um, so I'll give an example. Kibir means arrogance. Three letters. Ka, ba, and ra. Kibriya also means arrogance, but it's a deeper meaning. Because, and it's also kaf, ba, ra, and then there's a lot of other letters. Ya, alif, hamza. So you have six letters versus three. So obviously, the rule is more letters, more meaning. Got it? So yep. ki, while kibir would be arrogance, kibriya would be even greater arrogance. Okay? Now, if you know fasting in Arabic, we call fasting what? So. Okay, we call fasting so. But there's also another word, and that is siyam. One of them is three letters. Sad, wow, mim. And the other one happens to be four letters. Sad, ya, alif, mim. Okay? So one of them has four letters, and the other one has three letters. Now, the rule, as I said, is that the more letters, the more meaning. So naturally, you can say to yourself that maybe siyam has more meaning in it than the word sawm, which is three letters, and this is four letters. And although, as I said, that's a rule, the, uh, sometimes that rule is also broken as well. And in this case, that rule is actually broken. And, and there's a reason why. I'll explain to you. Uh, just stay, stay with me, inshallah. Now, a, for Arabs, and what I mean by Arabs is pre-Islamic Arabia and Arabs up to 130 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. For Arabs during this time, the word Sawm and Siyam was used interchangeably. So they could use both of these words and they could pretty much say, you know what, uh, it's the same thing, okay? But the Quran never allows that idea of the same thing to be done. And this is something that is throughout the book of Allah. Every single letter is chosen with great care. Although the Arabs, they considered Salm and Siyam almost synonymous or synonymous itself, right? Although they did consider it like that, when it com comes to the usage of the Quran, no. Allah decided that I'm going to use Siyam for a specific meaning because it's got more letters, it should have more meaning. 
and I'm going to use song for another meaning. It's got less letters. It should have less meaning, okay? So he even went against the natural uh, language structure of the Arabs because this is the Quran. It's got to be even far more beautiful than the regular Arabic speech. So in the Quran, throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not call fasting song. He only calls fasting siyam. Because in siyam, you're going to be withholding from a number of different things. You're going to be withholding from foul language, from uh, backbiting, from uh, tail bearing. You're going to be withholding from food, from drinks, from sexual activity. You're going to be withholding from a lot of different things, right? All of that is within fasting, within siyam. So there's a lot of withholding going on. So for the purpose of this lots of withholding going on, Allah uses the word siyam because it's got more letters. It should have more meaning. Now there's another psalm, quote unquote, another type of withholding as well that uh, that is described in the Quran in Surah Maryam when she says, فَقُولِي إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَنِ صَوْمًا فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْ Say that I have decided to do a psalm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that, I am not going to be speaking to any human being today. So what that psalm was, he decided that I'm going to remain silent for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that silence was something that was a religious practice within their time and their, their, their religion. And so she was practicing a, a silence and hoping for a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that silence. So in silence, you're only withholding from what? One thing, which is speaking. So the word that's used for withholding over there has less words, less letters, three letters. Whereas when it comes to fasting, you're withholding from eating, drinking, uh, smoking. If a person smokes, may Allah protect us all. You're withholding from, uh, you know, uh, backbiting, tail bearing. You're withholding, withholding from fighting with people. You're withholding from a lot of different things which otherwise you're able to do. So more words, more meaning. Less words, less meaning, even though in the Arabic language, in the origin of the language, uh, both words are used interchangeably by different tribes, perhaps, right? So, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't allow for that to just be just like that. Rather, he wants to make sure that even if the word has a similar meaning, I'm going to look at the structure of the meaning as well, okay? Uh, of the word as well. And, I'll, and, and be considerate of the structure and accordingly choose one word over another in one place over another as well. Okay, so that's when it comes to fasting, salam and siyam. And uh, last but not least, and now I'll talk a little bit about hajj as well, last but not least, and and that is hajj. Now, there's a verse in Surah uh, Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَعَى إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلَ For Allah, upon the people, is that they make hajj to the house of Allah, whoever is capable of doing so. Okay, whoever is capable of doing so. Now, for the cap word capability, there are two words. There are a number of words, but there are two famous words in the Arabic language uh, for the word capability, uh, for the concept of capability. So there is the word qudra, right? That's why we call Allah the Qadir, right? Or the Qadir. And that's why we have the name Abdul Qadir, the slave of the one who's all capable, the Abdul Qadir as well, which is this slave of the Qadir, the, the, the all capable as well, right? So there is the word Qudra and then there's the word Istita'a. Both of them, if we were to do a direct translation, they both pretty much come out to mean capable and capable. But Allah uses the word Istita'a for those people who are capable, they should make Hajj for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the word used is Istita'a and not Qudra. Let me explain the difference between these two words. The word Qudra, it simply means an ability to do something. Okay? An ability to do something. Now, is a person physically able to pray if he is physically strong, mentally capable, and knows how to pray? He's physically able to pray, right? You with me, brother? Yep. 
He's physically able to pray. But if I take his hands and I tie them up, his body is still physically able to pay, uh, pray, but something is going to be stopping him from that prayer. Isn't that so? Of course. So the person has the quality of capability within him because his arms are functional, his legs are functional, his mind is functional, his tongue is working, he's able to stand, sit, and all of that. But now that he's been chained, he can no longer move in order for him to be able to do the movements of prayer, right? So that is Qudra. You're capable, but perhaps there's going to be something hindering you or something blocking you, okay? Whereas the word istita'a is more than just personal capability, that is being capable and also being enabled to do something, okay? Although most of the translations will say capable, but I'm, I'm giving you the deeper meaning of the word istita'a, it's being capable and also being enabled to be able to do something, okay? And that's why if you look at the books of, of, of fiqh, they don't just talk about the cap physical capability of a human being, they talk about the capability and they talk about him being enabled also to be able to make the hajj as well so allah chooses the word istita'a because istita'a has the word ata'a yuti'u or ata'a uh, which means uh, which means to obey so the scholars uh, the linguists they say that uh, that istita'a means that his limbs were able to obey him in what he wanted to do okay so you might have the money, you might have the wealth, but your heart is just not, it doesn't have the energy to be able to, it doesn't have the spirituality be, to be able to subdue your limbs, okay? So your limbs are not obeying you. And, and, and again, if the word qudra was used, this meaning wouldn't be there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he wants you to make hajj if you're capable. And he also wants you to make hajj bearing in mind that you have to also be enabled. There has to be a plane that's going to take you uh, or a ride that's going to take you, you you're, um, there has to be tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is going to enable you as well to be able to make that, that hajj as well. Your body, your body should be responsive enough for you to be able to make that hajj. And all of those meanings are encapsulated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the word istita'a, which is not again there in the word qudra as well. And these are basically three or four examples that I've given you, maybe five examples of words. Otherwise, uh, throughout the Quran, we'll see this in the five pillars and also other than the five pillars, because they'll be there in every single uh, walk of life and every every single aspect of, of life as well within these rituals and outside of these rituals as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be able to see the Quran as a uh, guide uh, that increases our spirituality and faith and un makes us understand that uh, this book was not just written by a human being and it was not just created uh, like that, rather this is a sifa, this is an attribute from among the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is divine speech it came from Allah, that's where it started and it was given to humanity as a gift I ask Allah to bring us closer to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that he makes the book of Allah the fountain of our hearts, Allahumma ameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Ameen uh, Shaykh Abdul Wahab Salim, thank you very much, mashallah uh, there was no points uncovered, no stones unturned. Uh, really, it was very beautiful. As the title suggested, uh, a fresh Quranic look at the five pillars of Islam. We looked at, you looked at the Tahara, Tayyamum, Zakah, Siyam, and uh, uh, Hajj, the capability of doing the Hajj. Really, it was very beautiful. Thank you for explaining uh, all these word choices uh, in the Quran about the five pillars of Islam. And it was really beautiful. This really was a refreshing book. Uh, so with that, uh, we come to the end of our winter retreat. Thank you for being part of this, Shaykh Abdul Wahab Salam. It was really beautiful. Allah I Allah hope uh, there'll be lots of benefits uh, regarding this topic. Thanks so much. Jazakallah khair for having me. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, gives us the ability to conclude our lives on a po positive note, just as we're concluding this retreat on a positive note as well. Allahumma amin. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The fountain.